What's up, future respiratory therapists? In this video, we're gonna be talking all about the difference between the arterial and the entitled partial pressure of CO2. You're not gonna to wanna to miss this, let's dive in. All right, so as I stated in this video, we're talking all about arterial to entitled CO2 gradient. Let's jump into it, but before that, don't forget to check out the link in the video description below where I'm gonna take you directly to this page where you can access material and resources from the Respiratory Coach Academy. Now, here's the free resources page right here. This is what you can get for absolutely free. If you're looking for more help to pass your MBRC exam or maybe the, 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 the CSE, then I've got you covered. The TMC Bootcamp, the CSE Bootcamp, as well as a course focused on formulas associated with respiratory therapy, pharmacology, and arterial blood gases. We're not here for that today. We're here to learn all about this gradient that exists from arterial blood compared to entitled carbon dioxide. That's what we're talking about here, okay? So when you think about this, you have to realize that <clears throat> there is a certain amount of carbon dioxide. So what do these letters mean? Let's just stop right there. What do these letters mean? The P is pressure of CO2. So this is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And when we say little a here, we're saying arterial blood compared to in tidal CO2. <clears throat> now, when I say in tidal, let me explain what that means. You see, Every single time we take a breath, we take what we call a tidal volume. So when I inhale, I just brought in a certain volume of gas. And one breath is called a tidal volume. When I exhale, that is what we call exhalation. And I'm exhaling. That inhale tidal volume is now exhaled. <clears throat> and when we're using devices such as uh, capnography or capnometry, then we can actually measure the partial pressure of that exhaled gas. Now, when we say in tidal, we're talking about the, the measurement of exhaled CO2 at the end of exhalation, the end tidal CO2. So that's what we're talking about is the end of expiration. What is the measured CO2? Now, before I go any further, what I want to do is take you back to a video that I did last week where I talked about the PA to little a O2 gradient. Now remember in this video, we said that P big A O2 is always greater than P little a O2. That's what we said. P big A O2 is always greater than P little a O2 because you can't get more oxygen into the arterial blood than what comes into the alveolar units. And that makes sense, right? I mean, you remember that, 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 that makes sense. You can't have a P big AO2 of a hundred and have a P little AO2 of 120. It doesn't work like that. Gas goes from high pressures to lower pressures. The same concept applies to the arterial, to the entitled CO2 gradient. Let me show you what I'm talking about. See here, we're talking about blood flow coming back. So we know that CO2 comes back through and past the alveoli and CO2 goes into the alveolar units. Now we have more CO2 in the alveoli that we exhale. And this is where we measure end tidal CO2. Now, again, let's just think about this. Can you get more CO2 exhaled than what came back and diffused into the alveoli? No, you can't. But the more important question is why not? Why is it that in tidal CO2 will always be less than arterial CO2? Here's the answer right here. We're going to go to good old Egan's chapter 13. I'm sorry, chapter 11, page 240, the 13th edition. And we're going to read this sentence right here. It says, if all lung units contributed CO2 equally to the expired gas and there was no anatomic dead space, that's the answer to the why. Anatomic dead space. Then 
exhaled CO2 would equal arterial CO2, and the VD to VT ratio, the dead space, would be zero. But, big part right here, because of anatomic and alveolar dead space, then PeCO2 is always less than arterial CO2. You see, the answer to the why is dead space, and it looks like this. Let's take a second here. This is what we're talking about. You have lungs and you have airways. Gas exchange happens throughout all of these areas right here. Gas exchange does not happen in the airways. So when we exhale and we talk about anatomical dead space, this is what we're talking about. All of this is anatomical and dead space all the way up to the upper airway, the oral and the nasopharynx. All of that is anatomical dead space. That decreases the amount of CO2 that we can actually exhale. And then put on top of that disease processes that create alveolar dead space, such as emphysema and pulmonary embolism, then we realize that that is even going to further dilute the amount of exhaled CO2 that, or the amount of CO2 that we're capable of exhaling. And so it comes back down to anatomical and alveolar dead space being the reason why we would see an increase in this gradient. If you eliminated all of that, at best, arterial CO2 would equal end tidal CO2, but it can never be greater. End tidal can never be greater than arterial CO2 because that's a representation of how much CO2 is coming back and diffusing into the alveolar units. That's why we see this gradient. Now here's uh, my pet peeve because I think capnometry is, is um, obnoxiously underutilized in and during our, our mechanical ventilation process of our patients. Now, somebody's gonna comment and say, we use entitled CO2 on every single patient. And I love you for that. Thank you so much. But there's a lot of mechanically ventilated patients out there right now that are not using and not implementing entitled CO2 to allow us to non-invasively monitor our patient's ventilation. And here's the reason we get this the most. When I ask how come we aren't using entitled CO2, the answer is, is well, because arterial and entitled CO2 never correlate. Well, you now know why they don't dead space. You see, there's a gradient between the two, and we can use that gradient to track arterial CO2. We can also use that gradient to, to indicate to us when dead space problems are increasing or arising. We, we can use it. I, I, I Real quick here, I had a patient one time that was on a mechanical ventilation with entitled CO2, and in a matter of minutes, I literally watched their entitled CO2 go from 40 to 38 to 32 to 28. I looked at the nurse and I said, hey, you may want to cycle that blood pressure cuff. And, she, and, and the response was, is, well, I, I just did and it was normal. I said, yeah, but something has changed here because I'm looking at my entitled CO2 and it's dropping rapidly. My mechanical ventilation, my mechanical ventilator parameters had not changed at all. So I knew it wasn't a change in ventilation. I knew it had to be something else. They cycle the blood pressure and it comes back 60 over 30. Recognize it like that because of the utilization of entitled CO2. And that's what makes you an exceptional respiratory therapist versus average. So that's the arterial to entitled CO2 gradient. Remember, they are typically very, very close in value. But when they spread apart, you got to start thinking increased dead space and what is happening with my patient. Now, I'm Respiratory Coach. Thanks for watching here today. If you haven't already, hit the like, 
leave me a comment and also subscribe to me here at Restory Coach on YouTube. Also, if you will, come over to Instagram and TikTok. Follow me at Restory Coach, at Restory Coach, and on LinkedIn at Joe Lewis. If you have any questions, concerns, or comments regarding this video, send me an email, restorycoach at gmail.com. I'd love to get your email, uh, get an email from you and, and converse with you about this video or any other topic related to respiratory therapy. And remember, at the end of the day, every single day, average is easy. Don't be it.